Right guys, today we are going to talk about cardiovascular disease, known as CVD. Um, hopefully this is a recognisable diagram without it having been labelled of a typical blood vessel. Uh, just as a reminder, we have the um, elastic tissue, the muscle tissue, the endothelium, and then inside here we have the space where the blood travels through, which is called the lumen. Um, you should know this from, of course, from the structure of a blood vessels topic. What we're going to look at just now is some of the things that can go wrong with this situation. Um, things like a high fat or high salt diet, things like too much sugar in your diet, uh, poor exercise, can, uh, too much cholesterol, can all lead to uh, slight damage being done. Um, and there is a kind of a step-by-step -step process where cardiovascular disease gets worse and worse and worse. Uh, I have attempted to try and show that with three different colours at the moment. Uh, to start with, we're going to deal with uh, th this condition here called atherosclerosis, which is basically, uh, hopefully easier for you to say than me, uh, it's, it's the formation of something called an atheroma, we'll talk about it in a minute. That can then progress to uh, thrombosis, which is the formation of something called a thrombus, we'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, and then the final kind of stage, if you like, once we've gone past the other two is getting to the stage where we can have something called an embolism can occur. Now these are uh, new words, uh, grant you. You have to make sure you've got in your mind exactly what they are and what sort of stage they kick in. You also need to know a little bit about, there's a reason why there's a bit of space underneath the, the thrombus because we need to know a little bit about thrombus formation, um, which I will try and write large enough that you can read, um, but it will require my explanation I think as we, as we go through. Um, so, we'll start off uh, by talking about what this is, this atheroma. Now basically what an atheroma is, um, is, is what, what we say is, is a plaque. So it's a, a build up of tissue uh, that can occur from this abuse of your, your blood vessels as I was mentioning before, high salt, high fat diet, too much cholesterol. And what actually starts to happen is a little plaque starts to form underneath. Now it probably happened in several places. But if you continue to uh, perpetuate this bad diet, uh, they can get bigger and they can get bigger. Now, you can hopefully see, or certainly I'm, I'm attempting to illustrate here, that where an atheroma occurs is underneath the endothelium. Okay? So, as it develops and gets bigger, it's still underneath the, the surface of the endothelium. Uh, we can show it, I suppose it probably doesn't have too much of an impact there, but what I attempt to show you now is the knock-on effect of an atheroma being allowed to grow kind of out of control. So if we've got this situation here where this placky fatty deposit has started to, to uh, grow and get bigger underneath the endothelium, so the endothelium still continues around there. Uh, but what you can hopefully see has started to occur is that the lumen has become far smaller than it was. That's the, the main problem with an atheroma actually, is the fact that it makes the, uh, the lumen much smaller. So the formation of this plaque reduces the lumen and as you might remember from talking about what happens when blood enters the capillaries, as the lumen gets narrower, the blood pressure goes up. So we've added a, a, a higher, an area of high blood pressure to the body. And the problem with that is that along with all these other sort of bad things, cholesterol, glute, um, extra sugar, extra salt, extra fat, high blood pressure itself can actually start to do damage to the, the, the endothelium. And that's when we start to get really get problems. Now this is a problem but it isn't anywhere near as bad as what happens when a thrombus forms. And we're now going to talk to you about what happens in the next stage of a thrombus forms. So in order for that to happen, there has to be a bit of endothelial damage. Now you may remember from your immunology topic, I'm certainly hoping that you do because you know that will be in the prelim. Um, the immunology topic talks about what happens when uh, epithelial cells are damaged. There's no exception here. What happens is that blood clotting factors are activated. Blood clotting factors. Blood clotting factors will basically be floating about in the blood all the time in an inactive form. 
But if there's any endothelial cell damage inside the, the, uh, the blood vessel, these blood clotting factors are activated and that's when the trouble starts. Because basically what happens is when uh, blood clotting factors, which I'll abbreviate to BCF because I've written it there, but that's not a recognised abbreviation, so don't start writing BCF. But blood clotting factors which are inactive become active, they have a knock on effect. So, this active form here will actually act on another protein which is floating about in the blood called prothrombin. Now that in itself is what we would call an inactive protein, it's not actually doing anything but when the blood clotting factors activate it, so BCF, if blood clotting factors are activated by the damage, the blood clotting factor once activated then acts on prothrombin to form something called thrombin, that's the active form again. So. We call it pro, pro kind of means before as a prefix, so prothrombin is activated into thrombin by activated blood clotting factors, so it's a kind of a chain of events. Blood clotting factors are activated first, once activated they then cause prothrombin to turn to thrombin and then thrombin does something quite similar, it acts on a second or third protein if you want to look at it that way, which is called fibrinogen. And in the same way as prothrombin is the kind of inactive form, fibrinogen is the inactive form as well. And it is converted into fibrin, which is the active form. And those of you that have already heard this lesson, I talk about how fibrin kind of has the word fibre in it. All a fibre is is really a thread. So these long threads of fibrin start to form. And hopefully you can start to see if enough of them form and clump together, we start to get what we would define as a clot. Okay? And that's exactly what happens. I'll just take this blood clotting factors bit out. So blood clotting factors are activated by that damage. The activated blood clotting factors cause prothrombin to convert into thrombin. And then the activated thrombin then causes fibrinogen to turn into fibrin. And as soon as we start getting fibrin molecules, we start to get what we call a thrombus, which is basically a blood clot inside your, your blood vessel. So the blood clot starts to get bigger. As it does, all these fibres of fibrin start to be added on top of each other, all caused by this initial damage, of course, but the blood clot is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And hopefully what you can see, um, pretty easily see, I think, that the lumen continues to get smaller and smaller and smaller as the blood clots eh, gets bigger and bigger and bigger. So we're increasing blood pressure all the time and we're further increasing our chance of eh, damage which might cause even further thrombosis to occur. So this is somebody who has thrombosis now. There's clearly the formation of a thrombus inside the cell. I do try and um, remember this relationship as well. I'll let you kind of pause it. It's not the easiest to read. I'm just maybe going to turn the camera. I don't normally do this, but I'll just try and turn the camera just a little bit. Hopefully we can see. I'll read it out again. Blood clotting factors are activated by the damage. They then act on prothrombin to form thrombin, and then thrombin then acts on fibrinogen to become fibrin, and it's the fibrin that can form the clot. So that's what's happened in this person's blood vessel, right? The next thing that can happen though is, and this becomes even more disastrous because it, quite often this can be in a blood vessel that might not be doing you um, deadly harm, right? It might be like somewhere in your arm or your leg or something and you actually can sort of get away with having blockages in your, your uh, blood vessels as long as they're not anywhere too vital. But what can happen when a thrombus gets big enough is it can become so massive that actually a bit of it is able to be broken off, especially if it gets so big that the blood pressure becomes so high that actually it's forced to break off. So a bit breaks off and is able to float away in the bloodstream. Now, 
that in of itself, and so it was colour coding this, ruined my nice colour code. So when it breaks off, it's no longer considered to be a thrombus. That's a bit of thrombus that's floated away, uh, and that is called an embolus. An embolus. Right, so that's kind of the third stage. So when a, a bit of thrombus breaks off, it becomes an embolus, and an embolus, most dangerously, is able to travel through the body. And the problem with an embolus is it can reach somewhere more important, so it can get somewhere like a blood vessel in the brain, which is supplying the brain with oxygen. Uh, so a whole part of your brain might be starved of oxygen and, and temporarily be uh, unable to operate. Some of your brain can die. That's what's called a stroke. So if an embolus or even an atheroma or a thrombus forming in a blood vessel in the brain can cause a stroke. Uh, and if this embolus or indeed if this was inside the blood vessel of the heart, then that can cause a heart attack called a myocardial infarction. And that happens as a result again of oxygen being restricted from getting to where it's supposed to get in the heart. So the heart muscle needs a constant supply of oxygen. If there's a blockage in that, it blocks the oxygen. So do try and remember if you're relating um, you, you should be able to relate where a blood clot is to the type of condition it can result in. So if it's if a blood clot is in the brain, it can cause a stroke. If a blood clot is in the heart, in the coronary artery of the heart, it can cause a heart attack. Uh, but, but in both cases, it's because oxygen is restricted from getting to those places. Um, so that's the progression. We go from an atheroma, which is a plaque underneath the endothelium, to a thrombus we call thrombosis, which is an actual blood clot formed from damage eventually that happens to the endothelium. And then if a bit of that thrombus breaks off and starts to move through the body, we call it an embolus condition being an embolism. Okay, so that's cardiovascular disease in a very, very quick nutshell. Um, you may also refer to peripheral vascular disease. Now, peripheral vascular disease is basically what I talked about earlier. Any condition where there's a blockage or a, a blood clot or something in a blood vessel which isn't the heart or the brain. So somewhere like your arm or your leg or something, it can be bad, but probably not deadly um, unless it can it goes on the move like causes an embolism, right? Um, so peripheral vascular disease is something that you may be referred to. Um, the another thing to think about, which is a type of PVD is deep vein thrombosis, DVT. You may well have heard of DVT in the context of going on holiday. Remember going on holiday? Um, in planes, long haul flights, uh, where you're more likely to be sitting for a long period of time with you know strange pressures uh, in the air, uh, and you, you may be more at risk of a deep vein thrombosis. And to be honest with you, I don't really, I hopefully don't really need to explain what deep vein thrombosis actually is, because now we know what thrombosis is, right? Thrombosis is a form of a clot. So if you've got a clot in a deep, deep in a vein, it's called deep vein thrombosis, right? Uh, so that's the first stage of the cardiovascular topic. I suggest you watch that a couple of times, get your head around the three stages. Um, I will then cut it up this board, and then we're going to move on to talk about cholesterol. Now, cholesterol, just while I'm looking, Cholesterol can start to cause athero atherosclerosis. It's one of the, the reasons for it. I did mention that earlier on. Cholesterol is found in your diet. You need it. It's something that's required for cell membranes to work properly. So it's not something you can completely eliminate from your diet. However, your body doesn't need massive amounts of it. We've survived as you know Neanderthal man for you no. Know, Tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of years ago, we would have survived on a hunter-gatherer diet and had enough cholesterol within that diet. So we don't need to go looking for cholesterol. It's, it's easy to find in the diet. Problem nowadays, of course, is we're not Neanderthal man. And instead, we eat McDonald's and pot noodles and chippy and Chinese and whatever else. And it's full of cholesterol. So your body's dealing with a whole new problem. And that is that usually people's cholesterol levels are elevated. Uh, and that can lead to uh, atherosclerosis. So I'm just in the middle of talking, so we're going to rub that out as well. So cholesterol, as I said, is, is required in very small doses because every single one of your cells needs a very small amount of cholesterol to actually work. Um, for cell membranes to remain fluid, you need cholesterol. So uh, the body has to have a system for delivering that. 
Uh, but it must also, on the other side of the coin, it must have a system for removing excess cholesterol because, as I said, the damage it does uh, shouldn't be underestimated. So, as I said, cholesterol is not necessarily a baddie. It's because I'm talking and writing at the same time. So, um, it's, there's two different fates, if you like, of cholesterol. I want to, to look at it that way. Some of it is delivered to cells that need it. And probably most of it, to be honest, and somebody would say like a poor diet, most of it should be getting removed. Or it's actually probably better off putting that it's sent to the liver. to be disposed of. Right, and at, and at any one time, your body wants to be able to do both of these things, right? Because every single cell needs it. So the first priority that the body's got with cholesterol is to go around and basically check that all the cells have got the cholesterol that they need. But that happens pretty quickly, pretty readily. So the body has to then take any extra cholesterol to the liver to be getting destroyed, right? Now there are two different carrier proteins that do that, okay? We have, if I use a red square to denote cholesterol, right? You have these carrier proteins which basically have got a a little, sp a little space in them for cholesterol to join with. The ones that do the delivery to cells are called LDLs. Now we'll talk about what LDLs do in a little bit more detail shortly. Stands for low density lipoproteins. Low density lipoproteins or LDLs are your delivery drivers. The, the, the analogy I've used before with the class the last time we were in was Amazon drivers, Amazon delivery drivers, that's what LDLs are. Whereas on the other hand, we, we also have a second situation where sometimes cells have got all the, the possible cholesterol that they need and you still need to get rid of it because it is a, 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 to an extent can be a damaging thing. So you have these other, car these other carriers called high density lipoproteins and it's their job when they grab onto a bit of cholesterol, they take it to the liver to get destroyed. And I use the analogy I use with this is the bin lorries, right? So you've got Amazon drivers and you've got bin lorries. And basically what you want to have in terms of a ratio, a, a healthy person will have a, a ratio of these which favours HDLs. You want to have more HDLs in your body than LDLs because the problem with having lots and lots of LDLs floating about in your bloodstream is that any cholesterol that makes its way into the bloodstream is more likely to be caught onto an LDL and so that you're going to have these delivery drivers carrying the cholesterol around the body, looking for somewhere to drop it off and not having anywhere to drop it off. And again, we'll talk about why it loses the place to drop it off in a little second. But, so really what you want is some of them, you want a little bit of delivery going on, but the majority of uh, cholesterol you kind of want to be taken away by the bin lorries. And that's exactly what happens. If you're healthy, if you have a healthier diet, you exercise, uh, and actually if you get into a routine of higher um, of, of more exercise and a healthier diet, you will find your ratio of these two things will actually change, and that's been that's been clinically proven. So people that start to exercise and improve their diet will improve their ratio of HDLs to LDLs, and therefore their ability to deal with cholesterol in the proper way is improved. Now, so that's it. that's really the relationship. Very broad brush speaking, you could think about LDLs as being bad guys and HDLs as being good guys, but it really isn't that simple because you still need some of them, right? You still need to have some of them in your body. Uh, now, the only thing left to really talk about is this idea, as I said, you've had these delivery drivers driving about looking to deliver this cholesterol, but they can't, and the reason why they can't is something you need to understand. So we're going to remove the idea of HDLs altogether. That's everything you need to know about HDLs uh, altogether. 
their job is to take cholesterol, transport it to the liver, and it's destroyed. Okay? What you to consider a cell which requires the delivery of cholesterol. A cell which needs cholesterol, which is short on cholesterol, is going to display proteins on its surface. These are called LDL receptors. LDL receptors. And they do exactly what you'd imagine. They are there to receive LDL. So the LDL will move over to the uh, cell. If it finds a, a complementary match, which of course it will, because these are LDL receptors, it will join. Obviously it's carrying its little cholesterol as well. And as soon as that happens, the cell pulls this whole thing inside, so it sucks it inside, um, releases its cholesterol, breaks it down, and, or, or doesn't break it down, sorry, it will use it in the membrane, because that's what it's for. So that gets pulled inside. Now as soon as the cell has got enough cholesterol, i.e. it's got maybe however many molecules it needs to dot along its membrane, it then retracts all of these receptors, it pulls them all inside. So you end up with a cell which doesn't need cholesterol, and all its LDL receptors are floating about inside. In fact, they're not kind of floating about, that's how they're attached to a membrane. You don't really need to know that level of detail, but the point is that they no longer have a receptors on the outside. So that's why you can end up with this completely receptor-free cell, because it doesn't need any more cholesterol, so why would it be saying, give me an LDL, set, uh, give me an LDL? It's not going to. So that's what happens when cells don't need any cholesterol. They bring all their LDL receptors inside, and so LDLs with cholesterol attached are kind of helpless, they're kind of wandering about looking for a, a place to uh, dock into, it, and there's nowhere to do it. Uh, and that's when obviously your cholesterol level starts to increase in your body uh, and in your bloodstream and that's, that can lead to atherosclerosis and all those other things we just talked about. So uh, just to recap what we talked about there, we looked at the kind of three stages of cardiovascular disease. The formation of an atheroma, atherosclerosis being the result, uh, the, the damage, subsequent damage caused by atherosclerosis giving us thrombosis or thrombus forming a bit of that thrombus breaking off uh, to cause an embolism, so that's an embolus, uh, and then this idea that cholesterol, which we know contributes to atherosclerosis, has to be dealt with, and it's dealt with in two different ways. LDL is delivered to cells that need it, cells don't need it, they don't have LDL receptors, and HDLs are the, have the job of delivering cholesterol to the liver to be destroyed, uh, and we want to have more L HDLs than we do LDLs. Okay. Again, hopefully that makes sense. 23 minutes is a reasonably long video, quite a lot of information on that topic. Please make sure you watch this a couple of times uh, and pause it and rewind it and, and use it in, in the way that you can't really use a lesson, that's what I'm trying to say. So just use it at your own pace. Uh, the homework for this will follow it's Thursday now when I'm recording this. I'm not going to post the homework uh, until next week. So you've got a little bit of time to try and digest both this and the other videos posted today, the one on obesity and glucose. Okay, thanks folks.